Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is a special live episode of Dispatches. Today, I'm joined by my Breakthrough News colleague, Eugene Perrier, to discuss the latest developments in Niger following threats of military intervention by Western governments and their regional allies, meant to reverse an explosion of anti-colonial sentiment across Africa's Sahel. But before we jump into it, a quick reminder that you can support our work here at Breakthrough and access exclusive content by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube or in the live chat. And bring it in Eugene. Eugene, welcome back to the show. Rania, thank you so much for having me. It's always an honor to be a guest here on Dispatches. Well, thank you so much. And there's so much to talk about. I'm glad we get to do a live program on a very quickly developing issue. And of course, that's the recent developments in Niger. Uh, just a quick recap, back on July 26, there was a group of military leaders in Niger that ousted the sitting president. And since then, we've seen the West and its regional allies pretty much throwing a temper tantrum. Um, so Eugene, you know, most people didn't really know anything about Niger, especially probably people in the U.S. specifically didn't know anything about Niger, probably until last week when it was all over the media and, you know, media reports in the West. If you're if that's what you're consuming, you would think that this part of West Africa has just suddenly fallen into despotism and coups like out of nowhere. And somehow, you know, Putin and Russia are like poking it to make it happen. Um, and while there, of course, have been many coups in recent years in this region, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. What we're seeing in Niger follows these coups, you know, we've seen in Mali and Burkina Faso uh, and Chad, which came with lots of denunciations of Western imperialism and demands for respective sovereignty and a lot of anti-colonial sentiment, which you and I covered on this program a few months back, mostly anti-French sentiment mm -hmm. after lots of frustration with Western policies, not just resource exploitation here. You know, we're also talking about the sort of counterterrorism policies that have caused a lot of problems uh, in this region in particular. So all that said, you know, we're going to get into all the specifics of that, but we did just have the acting deputy U.S. Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, mm -hmm. visiting Niger um, and complaining she wasn't given access to either the former president or the new leadership. Um, so I guess you need, Eugene, let's start, let's start there. Can you just maybe break, maybe let's set the stage for our audience. Like what is happening in Niger? Who's the leader who was deposed? Who was he replaced with? And why? And then we can go from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that when we look at what's happening in Niger, I think the best way to actually describe what's taking place is a social explosion, it is the accumulated contradictions of the extreme poverty of Niger. I mean, we're talking about a country where roughly 43% of people are living on less than $1.90 a day. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Uh, also in the context of a challenging security situation, not just in Niger, but really, you know, relatedly across the entire Sahel, the uptick of terrorist activity um, over the past several years has been maybe less intense even over the past several years in Niger than, say, Mali and Burkina Faso. Um, but nonetheless, it's been very significant, very intense, and, and that uh, has also been a factor in what is is moving forward. And then I think, you know, just on top of that, I mean, these sort of immediate proximate causes, I mean, the poverty of Niger, uh, the security crisis that's happening in the Sahel are overlaid over the top of the fact that in general, Africa as a continent is at quite an inflection point um, in terms of uh, a generation of people. I mean, it's the youngest continent, as you know, you often hear something like 70% of the African population is under the age of 35, or, or I believe that's the exact number. But in Niger, you know, about half of the population is under the age of 15. Um, so it gives you a sense of, of the youthfulness, uh, not just of Niger, but the overall sub-Saharan African continent. But there's this inflection point that's taking place where I think there's a generation of, of people, the masses of people who don't want to live in poverty, marginalization, and humiliation. And I also think there are some important dynamics inside of the sort of elite subset of the existing sub-Saharan African states that is also shaking up the realities uh, and, and those two things coming together, putting together a very potent mix that is allowing for these social explosions leading to actual changes in the leadership of the country. So in Niger, you have the former president, Bazoum, who of course was 
uh, deposed in the context of this, who was, you know, in many ways sort of celebrated over the past couple years as being the first president to come to power after, I, I believe it was the very first quote unquote peaceful transition of power um, inside of Niger, although I think it's, you know, fair to say that it's not as if even in that context, everything was quote unquote perfectly democratic, but nonetheless, uh, really had staked out his ground. Uh, uh, the president, the previous president who was just deposed of Niger, had really staked out his ground as being very pro-Western. Um, and over the past year, especially, had been very critical of Mali, of Burkina Faso. I mean, first and foremost, around their you know counterterrorism strategies, he's criticized Mali for working with Russia. He criticized Burkina Faso for arming its own citizens to try to increase um, you know the level of offensive that they're able to do in the context of, of the various conflicts that are going on. He was very close to France. I mean, obviously, in Niger, predating him. Him, but certainly he continued. The French military presence was significant, continues to be significant. I think it's, um, you know, there's roughly, there's also a huge American military presence that's there. There's about 1,500 French soldiers in Niger currently, uh, 254 from Italy, 1,100 from the United States, and uh, 60 from Germany. And the United States has a huge drone base there, one of the largest drone bases uh, in the world, actually, that is, you know, allegedly a part of this broader counterterrorism space. But Bazoum, ultimately, he was sort of holding himself out as like the key guy for the West in this region. You can have your troops, you can have your bases. Um, you know, they had promised many things to him as well in terms of large sums of money, promised from the EU and so on and so forth. A lot of that has not materialized. Uh, like last December, for instance, they said they were going to give 32 billion euros over the next number of years. But you can even look at the disbursements that have been paused. I don't know how realistic that was. But nonetheless, you know, there was some backing for where he was. So, you know, the head of the presidential guard uh, is who is leading the uh, sort of committee of people, mainly soldiers now, although, of course, they have appointed a new prime minister just this morning um, from the civilian sector uh, that have taken over uh, is, is, you know, coming out of a military establishment that predates the current president. You know, at least allegedly, uh, they say that uh, uh, the new head, I believe Shashani is how you say it, um, that he, in fact, was, uh, you know, very close to the former president. He did, in fact, play a key role in preventing some coups previously. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that's his history is in the military establishment um, tied into the sort of political establishment and how that works with the broader elites in a country like Niger um, and, you know, had moved very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of different context. And, you know, I don't want to get into it all here. I mean, there's a lot to be said about, you know, whether or not he was potentially facing ouster or whatever it may have been. But it does seem that there was a basic disagreement over some of the key aspects. When they took over, they said that they were doing it because of the security situation um, and also because of poor, or I think they said bad, social and economic governance. So that is, uh, you know, to some degree, there's the proximate factors that I think are what's bringing the population onto the streets uh, in order to, to support this. And I think you can see that that's very clear. You know, I want to note that there was a Reuters article that I believe came out today, might have been yesterday, but they were out there. They had a reporter on the ground, just to quote directly from Reuters, Residents of Niamey, it's the capital of Niger, who spoke to Reuters, were strongly supportive of the coup. Uh, and then also they went on to say that people wanted there to be a closer relationship with Mali and Burkina Faso. But you can see there you have the proximate issues of the security issue, poverty and so on and so forth that I think is leading the masses to support this coup that seems to at least rhetorically at this point say that it's speaking to those concerns. And then I think you have sort of the the internal politics of the the quote unquote regime in and of itself uh, that are playing out and those two things coming together are what you know made it possible for the president to be overthrown. Yeah, I really want to uh, emphasize what you mentioned there in terms of like what was Reuters quoting somebody. There was something like thirty thousand people who gathered in the capital of Niger um, on August six, which was the deadline um, that they that Niger was given to to reverse course by the economic community of West African states, backed by the US and France. Um, before, before we discuss um, what that economic block actually means and all that, you know, the stuff about that deadline, I also just want to uh, add, just because you were talking about who the deposed president was, I mean, he really was the West's man. I just want to note, he he wrote this last week. This is a opinion piece that he he wrote, I, I assume, with a bunch of lobbying groups, because typically when it comes to this sort of thing, um, placed in the Washington Post of all places, it's typically written by like this or that think tank or lobbying group. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is the former president of Niger. The headline says, my country's under attack and I've been taken hostage. And, you know, um, the article 
makes a lot of very pro-Western points, but this one really spoke to me. He says, in Africa's troubled Sahel region, Niger stands as the last bastion of respect for human rights amid the authoritarian movements that have overtaken some of our neighbors. While this coup attempt is a tragedy for Nigerians, its success would have de devastating consequences far beyond our borders. With an open invitation from the coup plotters and their regional allies, the entire Central Sahel region could fall to Russian influence via the Wagner Group, whose brutal terrorism has been on full display in Ukraine. And I mean, that to me just says so much, just really hitting like the talking points that you've got to hit to like tug at Western you know, hearts. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I just, you know, just to point out this person who was deposed, you know, the U.S. claims to care about democracy and human rights, but we know that's not true, um, given a lot of various American uh, client states around the world and the characters of their regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about maintaining somebody who's very much pro-West as opposed to who has now taken over Niger. So just, that's an important, I think, um, you know, uh, a point to raise, Eugene, is what do countries like the U.S. and France want with a country like Niger? Why is this area of the world so important to these imperial powers? And we talked about this in the, you know, the last time that I had you on dispatches to talk about the Sahel, but it's specific, specifically like with regard to Niger, why is this country so important to, you know, Anthony Blinken and to Macron? Yeah. Well, I want to just take one step back and address, you know, directly the point that you highlighted, because I think it's it's extraordinary for people to 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 know Niger, to say that and to think about that. And I think it speaks directly to what's happening now. When you've seen the mass protests that you mentioned, Rania, for instance, the stadium protest, and we've seen a number of other large protests in the capital of Niger since this coup has taken place or, you know, so-called coup. Maybe it's better we call it a military transition, given the level of popular support that it seems to be getting. But those demonstrations have been very uh, majorly supported by a coalition of organizations that goes under the title of M62. Um, and that's the because the when they were founded was 62 years after the independence of Niger. And to speak directly to the issue of human rights, you know, their ability to protest and they were protesting prior to this for several years against French neocolonialism and also very significantly around the social and economic conditions being faced by the people of Niger. And not only were their protests suppressed, but some of their leaders had been imprisoned, including one of their leaders who was imprisoned and at least according to them was falsely alleged to have been involved in some sort of, you know, fire terrorist action in the gold mining fields. But according to human rights organizations, he was actually there gathering information about the violation of human rights um, that takes place regularly for those who are working in the mines and in other areas of the government there, uh, of the economy there. So the idea that somehow Niger is some bastion for human rights prior to this um, is quite frankly, completely absurd. It's the third to last country on the human development index. And it's been, you know, the last country several different times. So the violation of people's basic human rights is, is, you know, is constant there. But to speak more directly to your, your point here about why is it that Niger is so important? I think there are a range of different reasons. I mean, you know, one reason is, you know, one that I think we've already sort of spoken to, right, is that it's a platform for power projection. So outside of any particular thing about Niger, it's essentially sort of like, a I don't know, an aircraft carrier on land is maybe a way to explain it to people, right? It's a country that is more than willing to allow its land, its land and its airspace to be used by the European and American military power to put whatever, to do basically whatever they want to do, but to allow them to have significant military forces there in the heart of the African continent, in one of the critical regions, the Sahelian region, um, that allows them to be able to project military power for who they may or may not want. And I think that that has a lot of benefits if you think about one of the countries um, that's at issue here in terms of ECOWAS, and that's Cote d'Ivoire. And of course, the president of Cote d'Ivoire, and again, this is why the whole thing about, uh, you know, human rights and democracy is so absurd. The president of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Alessane Ouattara, was, of course, originally brought into power in 2010 in what was essentially a coup in and of itself, because President Bagbo who had, you know, uh, was in at that time, had gotten crossways of the French and the United States. They wanted someone more pro-Western. And so after a disputed election, Ouattara was able to lead a military column backed by French military power uh, in order to, uh, you know, come in and take power. And then, of course, he ran 
what many would say in Cote d'Ivoire illegally for a third term in his last election most recently. And of course, they covered that up. But the point being, having a country like Niger, as you can see right there in the center, right there in the heart of Africa in general, Sub-Saharan Africa, critical region in the Sahel, um, that's an important factor to have a base and a, pay, and a space for power projection. I mean, obviously, the United States wants to control the entire world. And in the national defense strategy, it often makes the point that the key factor in how they control the entire world is, in fact, their regional alliances with various countries. And that's helped them. It's called some people call it anchor state strategy. Um, but, you know, they have these key regional alliances that are usually centered on one or two countries where they have, of course, a lot of economic things going on. And we can get to that and we will get to that. Um, but they have a lot of military power projection. So I think first and foremost, we have to think about it like that. Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, countries that were very close to the West have now moved outside of that space. Chad, which is right there next to Niger, is also very close to the West, although it's an interesting conversation about where, um, you know, they're falling on this actual issue. But ultimately, Niger is taking on an outsized importance because in the region overall, you're seeing the France, the United States, the EU, the Western powers in general start to lose some element of their hegemony. So there's that. Then I think there are just more sort of explicit things that are, are relevant um, to the overall piece. I mean, Niger, of course, is the second largest. Uh, uh, France gets the second most uranium from Niger of anywhere in the world. The first is Kazakhstan. But of course, for those who know France, they know that France is, uh, you know, uses quite a bit of nuclear power. You know, there's a range of different, you know, sort of statistics about this that like two out of every three light bulbs or something like that in France is powered by, uh, you know, Nigerian uranium. I don't know to what extent all of that is true. But nonetheless, Niger over the past, you know, really the entire existence of it uh, since the 1970s when France was making a big push on nuclear power has been one of the central uh, regions where France is getting this from. And obviously electricity is the most important thing in a uh, modern economy. So of course, you know, that's going to be a very relevant issue vis-a-vis -vis that. There's also gold in Niger. There's other you know, different potentially uh, rich sort of realities to it. Although I don't know how much that is direct. I mean, the uranium issue is directly affecting it. Some of the other minerals I think are less important. Um, but the other thing I'll also say is that Niger is part of the CFA franc zone. And I think that is an important factor for a lot of different reasons, but primarily because with this anti-French neo-colonial wave that is sweeping West Africa, the possibility of the collapse of the CFA franc zone in West and Central Africa um, is certainly something that could be on the agenda. It's one of the main things that's criticized. There's a lot that could be said about the CFA franc, um, but the main thing for people to understand here is the nature of how the CFA franc works means that it creates, especially for Europe, because it's a African set of currencies, um, about 14 different countries are using it, but it's pegged to the euro. So mm -hmm. just to cut to the chase on that, what that basically means is it creates a very, very valuable zone for essentially safe investment inside of Africa for countries in the eurozone to be able to bring their money in um, and to have it be you know, easy to sort of bring out in a way, like since it's pegged to the euro, you don't have to worry about differences in the exchange rate, uh, really changing the value of your investments. So even if you're not investing a lot of money, it's an area where there's 160 million odd people um, where you can have relatively safe investments. It also helps, uh, you know, increase the value of imports over exports. So it means it keeps them in a dependent state. And also on top of that, since they can't change their exchange rate, it also forces a very, se uh, very severe suppression of wages, which makes them warrants for low wage labor, which, of course, make things, um, you know, much more uh, uh, valuable. So Niger is just one link in that chain, but it's an important link in that chain. So both from a geopolitical power projection point of view, from the point of view of France's specific interests as it concerns things like uranium, and from the broader point of view of how the European Union especially, um, but also the United States, want to try to maintain Africa in a dependent, subordinate position, just being in sort of the broader CFA franc zone and the possibility of removing it from that space does create you know, a whole range of unknowns in terms of what this would mean for imperial strategy, both politically and economically, uh, if Niger, in conjunction especially with Mali, Burkina Faso, and perhaps Guinea and others, start to move in a much more uh, anti-imperial direction from the point of view of how they're you know, dealing with their trade relations and potentially at least how they're dealing with their domestic politics. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point you made at the end there about the sort of like regional axis we're seeing p potentially uh, form between some of these countries that are making very grand statements against imperialism. But real quick on the economic element of all this, you know, 
uh, I had mentioned before when we were talking about this, the, the people who are coming out in the streets and actually supporting what you called like a military transitional government. Um, it was around 30,000 people over the weekend that had gathered in the Capitol um, and specifically on August 6th, because that was this deadline that the economic community of West African states, which is this regional economic bloc, had given. It seems at the behest of the U.S. and France, led by Nigeria, saying if you if, if Niger doesn't reinstate the former president or reverse course, we will militarily invade this country. We will intervene militarily. And of course, their bluff was called that did not end up happening. However, there also were hundreds of people, I'll note, in Niger who also took to the streets in the city of Arlit, where this French company, Oreno, which is the successor of the colonial state-owned mining company, Arriva, uh, had been, has been mining uranium for decades, which you mentioned the issue of uranium. Um, and it's this like very clear, obvious representation of that kind of neo-colonial extractive industry that France has very much continued to impose on countries such as Niger and across this region in particular. Uh, but can you explain, Eugene, what is the this economic community of West African states and what is their role in pushing Western imperialism? I mean, we've seen them again led by Nigeria, essentially using their economic might to cut off Niger's access, I think, to its own central bank funds um, and basically, you know, on top of the U.S. cutting off aid to Niger as well, basically trying to impoverish an already very much impoverished country. You also have Nigeria apparently cutting off electricity to Niger, which is amazing to me. They even need to get electricity from Nigeria to begin with, but that's that's quite um, that's quite a devastating thing to do to a country. So, anyways, can you explain what this economic block is and why it matters? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a number of different points that you've raised there. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Arlit, of course, which is uh, one of the main uranium mining areas where, according to research from Greenpeace and others, the amount of radiation that's in the water and the air is about 500 times what it's supposed to be in terms of normal reality. And if you stay there for one year, you get about 10 times the dose of radiation um, that you would, you know, you, that you should be getting basically, essentially. So you can see that the groundwater there, the air has been extraordinarily polluted. Uh, there's a lot of research on that if people want to look into it, but the the sort of, you know, antecedents, I guess, or the, the whatever, the leftovers, whatever is happening with this uranium mining is poisoning people, killing people. It's terrible in these areas. And I think, you know, that also speaks to the inequality of the reality of this mining. I mean, you can also point to the fact that some of the largest mines that are out there, you know, really only like uh, there's a large mine, the Imau Arn mine, I think is how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I'm I'm butchering that, but nonetheless, that's actually one of the largest uranium mines on Earth. It's actually not operating right now, and there's a whole sort of separate story about that. But it looks like it's going to start operating again next year using a very controversial method um, that will be even worse for the environment. But I raise that just to say the government of Niger only owns 33% of that. So it's like this hugely rich, you know, reality, um, potentially, but uh, ultimately, you know, the vast majority of the funds are, are going to be going back to France. Um, but, you know, maybe that's a slightly separate issue. I know you wanted to get into to ECOWAS and what's really happening um, there, but I did think it was important. I do think it's important to raise some of these subsidiary issues about why people are supporting the, this, this military transition, because I think there's a lot of confusion about that. Um, and the fact that people's living standard is, is very, very low. Again, this is a country where about 43 percent uh, of people are living on less than a dollar and 90 cents a day uh, and where, you know, of children five to 14, I think there's like roughly 40 percent of them are what are known as working children. Um, so you've got a huge amount of child labor that's going on there and you've got 20 percent of the population that cannot actually feed itself on a day to day basis, which means that they're partially, if not wholly dependent on humanitarian aid. So that's partially these are the reasons some of the reasons why people are taking to the streets, demanding a change from the existing government, this idea that it's a democratic whatever, 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 um, is another question. But that leads me to the point you're making about ECOWAS, because, you know, I, I don't actually know to what extent ECOWAS is doing this on, beha on the behalf of the West. I don't know if they need to, because they are a part of a, you know, corrupt cabal that is directly linked to the Western imperial powers to keep Africans poor. And that's what they're concerned about. And if you read all the things that are happening, you say that they're concerned about a domino effect. Well, why would they be concerned about a domino effect? I mean, if this is so evil and so bad and, you know, democracy and they're all so great, why would they be concerned about being potentially overthrown in their own countries? 
But the former finance minister of Niger, uh, of the former deposed government, he actually made this point last year vis-a-vis -vis the oil production in Niger. And there's now increased oil production happening there. Um, another thing where the benefits are going primarily to people outside the country. But he said that because it was in the context of climate change. And he said, well, we can't afford not to pump the oil because we we need the money, like because people are so uh, in such dire straits. And he actually called the situation inside of Niger a social time bomb. So I think it's important to note when we look at what's happening now, that social time bomb is going off because people are tired of waiting and they don't believe that the, the traditional political elites, at least in their entirety, are actually going to bring any sort of change. They don't believe that the national development plan of Bazoum that the EU promised $32 billion to is real. They don't believe the promises they are hearing from them. And thus, they are willing to support a government that's willing to displace them. And in ECOWAS, you have basically the same thing. I mean, ECOWAS as an entity is just a regional organization of West African states. And in that sense, you know, it's important to have regional integration organizations in Africa. You have ECOWAS, you have SADC, you have EGOD. I mean, that's good. You're, I mean, all African states would have to cooperate some way, somehow to unite the continent to really be able to use their economic power to the greatest extent possible because the borders are essentially all fake, especially in West Africa. Um, you know, I mean, I mentioned the president of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, I don't want to go on a long time. He's actually born in what's now Burkina Faso. And so, uh, you know, it just gives you a sense like that a lot of what's going on. You look at Niger, for instance, you know, about 53 percent of people, I think, in Niger are Hausa. Um, and obviously the Hausa are also very prevalent in the northern part of Nigeria. And so ultimately you have, you know, very long historic cultural connections there as well. So, you know, a lot of these West African cooperation organizations, or not West African specifically, African cooperation organizations are more or less that. But of course, any tool is only, you know, as, as useful or not useful as those who are wielding it. And the reality is, is the vast majority of African political regimes, no matter where they are in the continent, are regimes that are totally committed to the inequality of their own people, where a tiny layer of individuals at the top in these countries are getting very, very, very wealthy by be being the interlocutors between the exploitation of their resources and their people on the one hand, and the powers in primarily Europe and the United States, but quite frankly, really anyone who comes into Africa uh, uh, on the other hand. So they're basically saying, we're gonna stand between anyone who wants to do any business with Africa and the people of our own countries and our own regions. And we're gonna make sure that we get the most benefit from that over and above anyone else. And if anyone else benefits, great, good for them. But by and large, we know we will benefit the most by imposing the best possible terms for those coming from the outside, which means keeping Africa at the lowest rung uh, of development in terms of being only primary export producers, not pursuing significant uh, industrialization, not having a legitimate uh, approach as it concerns developing education, healthcare, and the like. I mean, technically in Niger, in the constitution, education is free, but only 37% of people are literate because there is not really any good high quality development going on in the educational sector because that is not where the money that is being created, which isn't, you know, comparatively isn't really that much compared to what's being made by these other countries. But nonetheless, I mean, this is what we see. So I think vis-a-vis -vis what's happening with ECOWAS, what you see is a feeling that there is a collapse of the strategy of these elites, that ultimately their desire to put themselves in the place in the hierarchy, which has been determined for them by other people by the neo-colonial powers that's making them very rich, that there's now a generation of Africans that are just like, no, we will no longer go along with this. We don't wanna see ourselves living in poverty like our parents, like our grandparents. And we no longer wanna have this sort of neo-colonial mentality, which you know, maybe when we, if we talk about Russia here, I wanna come back around to French neo-colonialism and why France is being focused on. But whether it's France, whether it's Britain, whether it's whoever, where it's, whether it's America's neo-colonial reality too, people wanna see a change. And yeah. at the same time, you also have a subset of elites that are in the military and different elements of the political establishment that, you know, have different motivations, I think. Some of them, I think, could be motivated by good things and want to also see a change for their country and are using their position to leverage that. Some of them probably just want to be in a position of power and are looking at this as an as an opportunity uh, with the masses of people being so upset for them to increase their own power. Third, and I think this is very significant, and I think it speaks to this issue of a, the social time bomb mentioned by the former finance minister of Niger, is that I think there are many subsets of the elites who, just like the masses, are also unhappy. Now, they, of course, don't really want to change the vast majority of living standards for the people of their country, 
in some of these cases, but they do recognize that they should be getting a bigger share of the pie, that they should be getting a bigger slice of what's going on. And after 30 or 40 years of neocolonialism, these people getting rich, seeing how this is working, I think to them, it seems a little ridiculous that in the context of a multipolar world where there's different centers of power rising, Africa still somehow seems to be on the bottom and they're not really necessarily being offered a position in any global hierarchy um, that they think comports to their position. And thus they're also taking advantage of the opportunity so I think you have a mix of different concerns in the broader elite military spheres of these countries. And then you have an ex you have almost universal sense of anger amongst the masses of people. Those two things coming together are very powerful. And I think these West African nations, all of whom are very poor, despite having many resources, can see if it succeeds in Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, that they potentially could be next to be swept out because they know their own people are very upset with the circumstances in which they're facing. And I think that's why they're trying to sort of strangle this situation in Niger in its crib, because they don't want to set the precedent for themselves to be pushed out of power and for there to be any potentiality, of course, for there to be a change in the hierarchical relationships between Africa and other parts of the world that have made them very rich, but have kept Africa very, very low down. So I want to I wanna, uh, hit on... Uh what you were mentioning about the idea of kind of like Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, they've sort of come together. We've seen a lot of statements by the leadership and I want to raise something and this is not to, um, this is not to pick on necessarily the intercept, but it's um, a common theme I've seen. So I'm just uh, highlighting this particular headline. Uh, Cause I think we, I want to challenge it. I want to, I want you to help me challenge it a little bit. And that is the idea that, in Niger, this is just another U.S. trained military officer leading a coup, right? And that there are, the subheading says, U.S. trained military officers have taken part in 11 coups in West Africa since 2008. And I think this is like a really um, superficial way to look at what's happening, to just see it as something that is having to do with, oh, this is just, you know, like a U.S., you know, per, like a U.S. trained person leading a coup and nothing more because it really papers over and collapses a lot of what you in particular just said. Um, and, you know, it, it's I think there's something more interesting happening here than just that. Right. Because there you know, you could go back to the past where there was like Arab officers who were trained by Western countries who then led various nationalist revolts and coups all throughout the 20th century. And I'm, you know, not necessarily saying that's exactly what's happening here that we're seeing like, you know, something particularly revolutionary happening, but it has the potential for that, particularly when you see what a lot of these leaders are saying. And that's why I want to bring it back to the significance of some of the statements and rhetoric that we're seeing, for example, from the leadership of these of the transitional governments of Mali and Burkina Faso. They issued this joint declaration essentially saying uh, that French and U.S. intervention, whether military or sanctions is seen as tantamount to a declaration of war against their countries. Um, you also have the president of Burkina Faso, who's this, this young man, um, Ibrahim, I can't, I'm going to butcher this name, Tuare, I can't say it, I, I apologize already. But this new president of Burkina Faso, if you listen to what he's actually saying, he's essentially vowing to fight imperialism and neocolonialism. He's uh, invoked his country's past revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara, on a number of occasions. He's quoted Che Guevara. You know, I think this is really, really an important shift in rhetoric that we see taking place. And then also from the leadership in Niger, we're hearing very anti-colonial, anti-imperialist rhetoric. And so I guess, Eugene, could you talk a bit about, maybe react to the headline I'm showing right here and, and maybe why you think it might be a problematic way to look at what's taking place. And on top of that, the significance of the fact that you have this kind of like growing axis of solidarity uh, between these leaderships that are saying things that we haven't heard in a very, very long time in terms of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist uh, rhetoric uh, that really speaks to the masses of people in these countries and the social explosion that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the the challenge with the headline is it's confusing, which I think you pointed to. I mean, sort of the implication when you read the headline is that somehow the U.S. is behind these coups. And I don't even know if, you know, Nick Terse and others at The Intercept, if that's what they're really saying. But certainly the way they're messaging it um, in this just a headline like this, I think, does speak to that. I mean, I think there's different elements to it. I mean, I think 
One element is there is a, the, the sort of kernel of truth in what's being said there is, is that U.S. quote unquote security strategy in Africa is not that different from U.S. security strategy in Latin America in the 1980s, which is to put a heavy emphasis on military aid, assistance and integration with the United States, because that's essentially a quid pro quo. Like if you are a rich elite in a country like Niger or Mali or wherever, right, uh, presiding over a deeply unequal uh, society you obviously want to have a strong monopoly of force to make sure that it's very difficult for people to even think about displacing you. And so, of course, the United States is able to trade on those relationships and not just the United States, France, the UK and others and say, like, well, we'll build up your military and use our own military forces to back you um, to set up your sort of repressive apparatus to protect your deeply unequal uh, political structure. So it it does reflect the fact that America is not at all really interested in any form of like democracy or human rights in West Africa. They're in, in they're interested in the main, maintenance of power. But the flip side of that coin, and this is where I think it becomes confusing, is just because you're trained anywhere doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, there's people doing terrible <laughs> things in the African continent right now who are trained right. you know, all over the Eastern Bloc, right? But they're not, you know, running around promoting communist politics. So, uh, you know, it doesn't work out for the countries like the United States when their own people have a change of heart and say, OK, well, it doesn't seem like it's working in the relationship we had with the West, with the United States and others. So we're going to actually use our position to make things uh, to, to sort of shift the, the narrative there. And I think that's sort of an important reality um, for us to understand and how this is happening. I mean, they're U.S. Western partners. Of course, that's where everyone is trained. Um, but there's all these other issues that are really lurking behind the possibility of these these, uh, you know, governments to be able to succeed. And I think that that ultimately speaks to the regional collaboration that you also mentioned between Mali, Burkina Faso, now Niger being added to some degree, Guinea uh, playing a role there um, is, you know, ultimately, and in interestingly enough, this is one of the other main criticisms of the CFA, Frank, is it sort of draws you away from intra-regional cooperation and more towards direct cooperation with the metropole. But again, that's another story for another day. Um, but that ultimately, this is the long-held dream uh, of Pan-African people, going back to the earliest Pan-African Congresses brought together by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois here in the United States, amongst others, is that, again, Africa is 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 falsely divided by these borders that are basically colonial and that the only way for africa to actually use its human and material resources in the most efficient logical and effective ways to lift the living standards of of the majority of people is in fact to have more regional cooperation now of course you know that can look different ways but that sort of like basic factor is a key piece to it so i think you can put all these things sort of in you know, one train when you look at sort of what's taking place here in these different spaces. I mean, first and foremost, you have the various issues that have brought people to overthrow the original government and put in these transitional regimes. People are very angry about the situation they're in, which is both economic and military. You have some subsets of the elites that whatever their motivations are, are willing to ally with that energy in order to change the, the, the governing power in the country. And then now when you're sort of switching and transitioning on that basis, you have to have some sort of different strategy for how to approach things. And so one of them is to increase regional cooperation. And so, for instance, one of the things that's been happening over the course of this, over the course of the weekend, was the 10th version of the sort of mixed joint economic council of Burkina Faso and Mali, which is basically those two countries uh, bringing together experts from both sides to figure out how they can cooperate on a range of different issues from infrastructure to agriculture to the military and so on and so forth to deepening their cooperation. We've seen things like Mali's re uh, relationship with Guinea when they were cut off from some of the other West African ports, now building new roads, new infrastructure to be able to use the ports there in Guinea, uh, which is also uniting those countries a little bit more closely together. And so you have sort of the emergence of a block of countries that are looking to pursue things in different ways. Now, there's a couple of different sort of pieces to this that are, I think, tricky. I think the first thing that we have to, to note here before we even go any further is, you know, the political changes have actually been more substantial so far than the economic and social changes. Now, I don't want to say what that means about what's happening moving forward, but I think what you have is a very sort of complex political issue here. I mean, on the one side, you have the masses of people who are, are organized, you know, often through sort of loose coalitions. I mentioned M62 um, in 
uh, uh, Niger. Uh, of course, there's there's uh, Yerowolo standing on the ramparts in Mali. Uh, there's the the coordination of civil society organizations in Burkina Faso, and these is uh, Wakitama and Chad. Different situation, but still relevant and important to raise. That have been organizing, you know, heavily against French neocolonialism, but also around issues of poverty, around issues of need to industrialize, around issues of Pan Africanism. So ultimately, they're coming from a range of different perspectives, but various Pan African anti imperialist and some case socialist and communist perspectives involving loosely organized organizations, left wing political parties, broad trade unions and others who are sort of all a part of this energy who want to be see big significant changes in how the country is is operated and for the vast amount of wealth to not only be leveraged better, but to then be redistributed in a way that speaks to the needs for people's or jobs industrialization, education, healthcare, raising the standard of living, and so on and so forth. Then you have a sort of a complex reality in terms of the, the elements within the government. Now, some of them, I think, are motivated, hopefully, by positive things. I mean, the point you made about Burkina Faso, I think those have been the sort of the country which sent the clearest signals in that regard. And of course, the prime minister there was recently in Nicaragua, recently in Venezuela. Um, so you can see to some degree, you know, also some, you know, genuflecting towards where they want to go um, there. But I think there's also people that are involved in some of these different spaces that we don't know fully what their motivations are. I mean, the very fact that the issue of Mali raising the amount of royalties for mining being something that is being considered, not something that you definitely would do, I think shows that there's varying different interests that are sort of at play here. And this is partially why you see the United States playing an interesting role. And when you see the commentary coming from many U.S. commentators in the establishment, uh, on the issue of Niger, you've also seen this with Burkina Faso, a lot of it is how maybe the U.S. should distance itself a little bit from France, and that the U.S. has an opportunity to use to focus on French neocolonialism to actually present itself as more neutral than it was in the past. And the point you made earlier about the free officers movement in Egypt, uh, certainly in Libya and other places, it's a very good point. And also in the Arab world in Syria and other places, because that is what the U.S. did with Egypt, right? Is that they did sort of put themselves between France, Britain and Israel and Egypt on the one hand and present themselves as more of a friend of the Egyptian people, the Arab people um, and the North African people more broadly. And there's sort of a similar sort of piece like that, because I think they feel it's not a done deal that all of these regimes will necessarily become like a radical anti-imperialist pole and try to develop its own space in a multipolar world, that there may be a, a world where the U.S. can find a way in there and be able to manipulate the situation. So I think there's some dangers there. And I think that we have to be, you know, very clear about what is you know, a, a very unsettled situation politically and which could go many different ways. And I think a lot of what's going to happen there and a lot of how we should market and understand it is what sort of social benchmarks are being hit. What's being done to take on more resources, to, to get more money from the resources of the country? What's being done to move the country up the value chain? What's being done to redistribute the wealth to actually uh, make a huge difference in education, in healthcare, care, uh, in infrastructure? Like what's really going to empower the working class? What sort of political instruments are being put into place that are allowing the mass organizations of the people to have input into how their country is run? Like we have to look at these things very carefully, or you could be in a situation where some opportunists could use the anger of the masses just to seize power for themselves and have basically the same setup, even if maybe they have some other countries that are also operating there. So I just wanted to say that to say that. But quickly, to go back to the regional cooperation, and this is what I think is important about Russia and about the BRICS issue and all of that. The Russia issue is, is heavily decontextualized. And the reality of it is this, the countries like Mali and others are not just working with Russia. I mean, they're taking a broader, more expansive view of their economic relations. That's why the prime minister of Mali was at Lula's inauguration, because they want to have deeper relations with Brazil. They actually already have some, which people don't, I don't know, know about. I just, are you sure, Eugene? Because I'm pretty sure, hang on, I want I just want to show this headline. According to Ukraine, Russia is actually responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there you have it. I just, since you brought up Russia real quick, I just want to point out um, a few different like things that we're seeing in the media. Here's uh, uh, Bloomberg quoting Anthony Blinken that the Niger coup was just Wagner taking advantage of instability. Um, also, you know, blaming it on Russia. And then what I had on before, uh, which was uh, the Wall Street Journal framing this, here it is, as how the U.S. fumbled Niger's coup and gave Russia an opening. So anyways, I just want to, since you mentioned Russia, point out how the media and the U.S. government and the French government are really trying to somehow put this on Russia. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it really is amazing. I mean, it takes all agency away from Africans. Everything is blamed on Russia. I honestly feel the same way about there's some people trying to blame it on the UAE and other countries. I, I mean, there's a lot of countries involved in Africa and we could do our own show on, on all of that. But the point being is that, you know, these people are people are taking action based on motivations that they themselves have and their relationship to the outside world is based on that. And so when you look at, you know, the BRICS countries, uh, all of them, I mean, and not just the BRICS countries. I mean, Iran, for instance, is now uh, building deeper ties with the whole range of West African states, not just the Malis and the Burkina Fasos of the world, but all over the place. Um, obviously, China is already heavily involved and is the number one trading partner of a lot of these countries already. Um, you know, India is also playing some role. Turkey is also playing some role. I mean, basically what you see here is that you have these, these countries that are making these military transitions in Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, and now Niger that are trying to respond to the broader sort of situation that for different reasons has brought different parts of the country into a space where they want to move up in the value chain of the world, that they want to move out of the totally subordinate hierarchy, and that they have to find allies that will work with them that will speak to that. And the reality is that Russia as a country does speak to that. And I think African people and African leaders are very aware of that, especially because of the attempts to use proxy wars and sanctions to isolate Russia. Russia is in a position where, to some degree, they, Africa can dictate to them. Um, and you can certainly see that in the context of Africa-Russia relations when you look at it. A huge amount of what Russia is doing is a direct response to the pressures and the demands being made on them, not just by African governments, but by African peoples and mass movements for what they'd like to see in a partner. But Russia offers a couple unique opportunities opportunities that I think is what people can see. First and foremost, outside of the United States, basically, Russia is one of the only countries that can provide legitimate security assistance far away from its own borders, right? So like how many countries can really actually assist you in waging a war against a massive insurgency that has grown significantly out of control? There aren't that many. Um, and one of the ones that's got a pretty good track record, if you look at what happened in Syria, is Russia. And even other countries that are willing to assist, like Iran and others, who are also themselves, you know, being addressed, uh, you know, in Turkey and others by some of these countries, UAE and others, none of them have the same real capabilities of Russia. So that's one. That's an important thing that these countries have to maintain. But if you say you don't want to work with the West economically, they're not going to give you any real support uh, from whether they were or not before is a whole other question. And I think most of these countries are questioning that and saying that the French and Western interventions were not helping. But even if they were, you're not going to get it. So you have to look for that. Two, and this is what speaks to the point about saying African countries, to some degree, being able to dictate, is that Russia has a pretty advanced economy with a lot of big, large, mainly state-owned companies that have certain critical capacity, especially around things like electricity generation, which is something you mentioned previously. You know, Nigeria gives 70% of the electricity to Niger, but Niger is producing a huge amount of electricity in France. But of course, Niger cannot produce electricity from uranium because they have no nuclear industry. They can't really produce electricity from anything else because they have no power industry. They have no ability to develop power lines. They don't have the human capital and material to be able to operate that infrastructure, even if it was built inside of their country. And so when you look at what happened in the Russia-Africa summit, this is partially why one of the things the African nations were the most concerned about was increasing the number of scholarships, especially fully paid scholarships inside of Russia, because they want to use the relationship in a way that can heavily advance strategic goals by educating more people around different tasks that they do not have because of the subordination of the economy. And they also want to work with Russian companies to move up the value chain. You can see they say they want Russian companies to build more fertilizer uh, plants themselves, uh, to work with them on building more power plants, to work with them on developing um, you know, nuclear science, not just nuclear power plants, so they could potentially use that electricity more. And also working with them on hydropower. Same thing with agriculture. Same thing with car parts. Same thing with tractors. Is that there is a possibility, and I think this is what many African nations are sensing, to leverage the geopolitical situation to make the relationship with Russia much more of a win-win relationship than they can get from the West, but even to some degree with China. Um, and that's a complicated issue, but I think there are a number of these countries that feel that Russia, in a way, is in a very kind of Goldilocks zone as a partner that can provide them with critical things that they need to actually meet at least partially 
the demands of the masses of people that are placing on these regimes that they place such great hopes in. And then if they really want to make a change, that they're then very much in the Goldilocks zone position to use this sort of political economic relationship to put things in place that will allow them to make significant moves to improve the living standard of the people who are there in their country. And that's why you see people appealing to Russia so openly, being so pro-Russia in terms of uh, how the, you see in these demonstrations. It's not that people are brainwashed. It's not that just people are handing out money from the Wagner group. It's that people are making a strategic wager and calculus about what is really required once they make what is a big change or attempt to make what would be a big change. And that is breaking the chains and the bonds of neocolonialism um, that have existed and that are really in French West Africa that much worse. I mean, you know, there's neocolonialism of all types, the former British colonies, similar issues. You look at the Nigerian elections. I was always shocked how much the Nigerian elections seem to take place in London. And there's like, critical <laughs> they're flying to Dallas to be with the diaspora. I mean, like, it's obviously there's a lot of bonds, but the French, you know, the CFA Frank issue, just the overall arrogance of French culture. I mean, you know, the way the language, for instance, there's more people who speak French in Africa than in France. But, you know, there's like a tiny French institute that determines everything about how the official use of the French language is supposed to be. I mean, there's just this arrogant reality to it, the France Afrique concept that I think just puts a finer point on that neocolonialism, which is partially why, you know, people have been more angry about it and why it's become more of a focal point for opposition in the the former french colonies than in some of the other you know nations former colonies because this just you know extra weight of french neocolonialism the way they sort of rubbed salt in the wound of how they used to be your colonizer the disrespect that african peoples are shown inside of france itself with the extreme racism and marginalization uh islamophobia and otherwise that affects the population of, of african people there in that country i think is played a unique focusing effect for general opposition to the neocolonial reality of African poverty. That is the case across all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's not just France, it's the whole European Union, all of the West um, as well, who are playing a role. But that's what's giving its particular space. And Russia, as a counterpoint to that neocolonial relationship, given the role they're playing in the world and their possible capabilities, is why I think we're seeing it come to the forefront in terms of street level popularity. No, that's 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 such an incredible point. And there's a, a bunch of other things I want to hit on here. But first, since we have so many people watching, I do want to remind those who are watching to please make sure you click the like button on this episode. Give it a thumbs up. It does help us in the algorithm. So more people see this incredible analysis uh, by Eugene, which we're not getting in the mainstream. And then on top of that, we have to do it every show please do go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news. If you can become a patron, um, becoming a member of, uh, of breakthrough news will get you access to exclusive content and also help us do more programming like this. If you like what you're watching and also please, if this, if you're new to this channel, be sure to subscribe to it also helps us in the algorithm. So yeah, please do like, uh, this episode, uh, if you can, um, but no, to, to get on one of the points that you did just mention, Eugene, um, in terms of security, I mean, when we're you're talking about France, right? Um, and the reason there's all this anti-French sentiment, of course, there's so much of that goes back to colonialism. Colonialism, of course, still matters, but there's also been things taking place in just the last decade alone. One in particular, or maybe not the last de the last decade, a little more than a decade, uh, the leaders of many of these countries, uh, such as Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, right? Many of these leaders, they're often denouncing the NATO intervention in Libya as leading to the destruction of the security situation in their countries. Um, though, of course, you don't, you never see these denunciations in the mainstream corporate press. They seem almost like allergic to reporting these sorts of things. I mean, we hear a lot about counterterrorism in this region and the issue of terrorism in this region, but where did it come from? And that's where I want to ask about, you know, what was the chain of events that were set in motion by the collapse of Libya? Because I think you could in many ways almost like have a direct thread from the collapse of Libya. And again, I want to show this map just to show people where Libya is in relation to the countries that we're talking about. Here's Libya at the top, right in the middle. And right below it is Niger, is Chad, is Mali. And of course, that bleeds into Burkina Faso and even into Nigeria. When we talk about a lot of the issues of quote unquote terrorism that have taken place in the last decade. So what was the impact of the situation in Libya. And then that did end up leading to a lot of resent, even more resentment towards France because then France justified 
its own intervention and having troops on the ground in a lot of these countries, particularly Mali, in which they were kicked out of, based on the idea that we have to go in there and help with the terrorism situation. But of course, they ended up just pouring fuel onto the fire that the West already created or, or lit, I should say. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting Benin has also seen, you know, a lot of spillover recently there. And I mean, when you look at the issue of the Senate of Nigeria, which is opposed to Nigerian military intervention, I mean, and, and a number of the people who were speaking out, of course, are uh, representatives of the Senate in the northern part on the border with Niger, is is exactly that. It's a recognition that this sort of intervention could have sort of a Libya-like effect where it could supercharge the, the issues that are at stake. I mean, there's a sort of complex series of issues that exist in the Sahelian region. I mean, some of them are are uh, actually climate change and environmental based. And I, I bring that up first because it's very foundational to what's happening uh, in all of those countries as you have increased desertification as the Sahara Desert moves further south as climate change becomes worse and worse, which is increasing basically every single possible competition for land and water and, and uh, resources and the where where those three things kind of intersect and are at, in contradiction with each other between you know herders, pastoralists, people who grow food, people who have herds of cattle, uh, mines and things like that that often use a lot of space and also water and other resources. Um, all those things together, there's a shrinking space in which they're happening, which is sort of in and of itself, you know, creating a space where more conflicts can, are and can happen. And that, you know, sort of take their own sort of reality there that goes even beyond some of the religious aspects. But that's another uh, piece that you have there. As a lot of these countries are, are heavily Islamic and, you know, many of them have been affected by going back to the 1990s, you know, significant movements in Algeria, other parts of, of this area that have tried to use Islam for, you know, the, I don't even want to say Islam. What they claim to be Islam, which mm -hmm. I think in and of itself is important to state, um, is a perversion, of course, of the religion. But they're using that for their own purposes, whether it be banditry, whether it be state building projects of their own, because they want to people want to control territory and they want to be the ones who extract the resources uh, at the expense of poor people as opposed to somebody else. But nonetheless, these huge insurgencies have kicked up. And then you also have some ethnic issues that have broken out in terms of the cross border reality of a lot of the ethnic groups in this area, people who want either certain levels of independence or different levels of autonomy or however those different things are working out. And so you have all those different problems that existed prior to the issue of 2011 uh, and the issue of the invasion of Libya. But the thing that happens is Libya had a lot of guns and other forms of weaponry. So when the Libyan state was destroyed in the context of this, it basically became a total free-for-all bizarre for weapons. And so ultimately, every single person who wanted to do anything negative now all of a sudden was able to deal with arms dealers who had like real serious heavy weaponry and even large amounts of light weaponry, which they could just sell. They weren't giving it away, but they could certainly sell like candy. And so that in and of itself had played such a huge role in supercharging all these uh, existing conflicts. And since they have all these deep complex underlying issues well they're actually not that complex they're easy to understand they're hard to solve because solving them means you know addressing the power relations that have created these circumstances and people with power don't want to give it up but nonetheless since they have that kind of character to it it then means you have the uh, possibility of prolonged deep very tough to, to, to stop conflicts um, now because you have the fuel on the fire uh, of these other issues. And of course, when you think you can win, it's hard to find a space in where you can uh, uh, actually have some sort of negotiated solution or some sort of coming together of whatever it may be. And that's played a huge role. And that is certainly, of course, what's brought these Western powers into the Sahelian region. Now, how effective that was, that's a whole other question. I mean, I think the point that Mali has made, Burkina Faso and others have made, is that violence has basically gotten worse and gone up uh, in the context of the 15 years of these various French-led uh, with U.S. assistance military campaigns. You know, in the West, they call this a conspiracy theory, but I can say this is something that's very heavily talked about all across the Sahel is not just was it ineffective, but were these countries, the U.S., France and others, you know, funding some of these groups and deliberately trying to create chaos in order to be the chaos managers to maintain control over them. Now, like I said, that's often said, oh, that's Russian propaganda. That's this, that's that. I mean, it's coming officially from the government of Mali, who claims to have evidence that they haven't presented it. Also, Burkina Faso, many people on the streets of these countries and in these areas believe this is true. So I think to call it a conspiracy theory, I, I think is, is wrong. And I think it denies some of the facts, basic facts that we know from the Manchester bombing, from the terrible Paris attacks that, quite frankly, a number of these terrorists 
They were there. They were in Libya. They were in Syria. They're in these different places. The government knew they were there. They were letting them go back and forth because they were for the overthrow of the Libyan and the Syrian government. And then they turned around and they committed these heinous attacks uh, in their own countries. But we know of these links between these organizations. And I don't think we can we can just dismiss the, 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 the suspicions and fears of Africans as conspiracy theories on this front. Um, I think we have to continue to look into this. I think there needs to be continued investigative reporting on this front. But either way, that's partially why uh, that's but it speaks more or less to the point I think that you're trying to raise here, which is, you know, what is the role of this? And, and I want to just make one quick connection, because the point you made about the sort of connection between the current reality and colonialism is very real. I mean, you know, in China, of course, they talk a lot about the hundred years of humiliation and that the Chinese revolution put an end to the hundred years of humiliation. Well, Africa has had like 500 years of humiliation. And I think a lot of it is quite recent, quite frankly, in terms of colonialism. And when you look at the history of these areas and you look again, and this is, I think, the thing about the, the anti-French element that people really have to grasp here and the broader anti-colonial element is this area of West Africa is historically extremely rich. I mean, this is the heartland of many of the greatest empires, the Mali Empire, led by the great Mansa Musa, who, of course, did his, his fantastic trek to uh, Egypt, where he had so much gold, he devalued the currency of Egypt for a generation uh, of uh, Askia Muhammad, the Askia the Great, uh, and the empire uh, of, of, of Songhai, I believe that was, of the Sokoto Caliphate and Usman Donfodio, of the Hausa kingdoms, which were, you know, city-states basically that were some of the greatest centers of Islamic learning and wealth in the ancient world. And so this is a history that African people know, but they've been so degraded we have been so degraded as African peoples, quite frankly, around the world because of colonialism, because of slavery. And then you have this situation now where these people are coming in and they're saying, if you don't like it, it's a conspiracy theory. If you want something different, you're controlled by Russia. If you want your own you know, currency, well, Africans can't manage their own thing anyway. So it's better to be tied uh, to us. The extreme arrogance of leaders like Macron and others when they go to Africa, or I note from where you are when he goes to Lebanon, <laughs> <laughs> lecture people, which is just, it's absurd. I mean, I remember when Hillary Clinton went to Africa and did her tour during the Obama administration, and she goes to every country and lectures them on corruption, as if America can teach anyone about corruption. I mean, look at what we're seeing in our mainstream press now about the Supreme Court justices, all on the payroll of billionaires. But nonetheless, this is something that is deeply felt. It's, it's the continuation of the historical past, and it still hurts. It's rubbing salt in the wound because it's a continuation of this idea that African people Peoples are ignorant, are, are un incapable, are lesser, have no agency, cannot operate and control their own countries outside of the aegis of, of Western eyes and control. And those things drive politics in a way that I think the mainstream Western media either doesn't want to admit or often wants to dismiss um, and doesn't want to put in its full context. And that's why people will say, yes, do a coup, take over, kick these people out, because all they've ever done is sell us off to the highest bidder around the world, and we want that to stop. And if people speak to that, people will rally behind them. Now, if they don't speak to that, then we'll see what happens subsequently. Um, and we've seen this in other places over the years that you know you make one change, and it's not enough for the masses of people, and you think you're going to stay in there, and they'll sweep you right out yet again. Uh, and I think that we're seeing this social explosion happening in West Africa is the key driver of this entire thing, a generation of Africans who do not want to live in humiliation, poverty, and subordination, and are building movements, building organizations, and supporting entities and political structures and military structures that seem at least willing to go some of the way with them to try to make a change in their own reality and improve their own circumstances. But this is a, a as much a bottom-up movement as it is a top-down you know, military movement. And I think we have to see that and understand that to really grasp what's taking place. Ooh, I love when Eugene gets into like preacher mode. We need some of that. But no, this is this is so important what you're saying. And before I just move on to a couple of thoughts to, or, or topics to wrap up on here, I want to remind people again, because we do have like 1,900 people watching, please do hit the like button. Um, it helps us in the algorithm. And this is such an important topic. I mean, the issue of Africa, especially, and the sort of uh, the, the changes we're seeing, historic shifts we're seeing across this continent uh, right now is of, of huge geopolitical importance. And it's, I mean, the more people who hear this analysis as opposed to uh, the propaganda coming out of CNN, the better. So please do hit the like button. Uh, do make sure you subscribe to Breakthrough News. Eugene, what you're what you're saying is 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 a part of that historic shift. And you mentioned something earlier that I want to hit on 
uh because i'd like you to elaborate a bit on it and that's the issue of multipolarity basically is you didn't use that word but that's essentially what you were talking about when you talk about the uh, importance of the relationship with russia there's also the importance of the relationship with china i'm not quite sure how china has factored in in terms of the changes in niger i mean i don't think china's really taken a side you know or, or said said much other than they want stability but the fact of the matter is that a lot of these states do have more room uh to do these kinds of things to say these kinds of things because there are more poles of power than just one. It's not just the U.S. anymore. And I'm curious if you think that we're going to see uh, more things like this taking place, not just in West Africa, but perhaps in other parts of Africa. I mean, we saw the Africa-Russia summit take place not that long ago. We have a BRIC summit coming up. I mean, this is all this this all is the kind of thing that the U.S. sort of foreign policy class has been warning about would would weaken the U.S. and would weaken U.S. interests. Um, and also just watching, you know, Victoria Newland rushing over to Niger and not being able to get a meeting with the new leadership, not being able to get a meeting with the old leadership and really the U.S. looking incredibly frustrated and honestly, you know, quite weak in this situation. Not that I want to see the U.S. invade, but I would I, I would imagine that not too long ago had something like this happen, the U.S. would have been able to put a stop to it much more quickly uh, than it has in this case. So. I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on the role that multipolarity is playing in the shift that we're seeing right now. Yeah, you know, I think it's a great question and I think it's playing a few different roles. And I think really the ultimate sort of underlying reality is that can Africa or elements in Africa start to become their own poles. And I think that's a lot of what's taking place, you know, vis-a-vis uh, the changes that people want to see. I think you're 100% correct, is that the rise of China in particular has opened up a huge amount of space for the African continent in terms of just having more people to work with. I mean, China and Europe kind of outstripped the rest of the world by far in terms of trade and relationships with Africa. And it was Europe was playing the key role prior to China's emergence. I mean, the U.S., economically plays a lesser role than either of those two politically plays a bigger role um and from an aid perspective plays a very big role which has its own politics attached to it um but now you had this new player of china that came in but it's now expanding beyond that i mean you've got the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, which are all, of course, very rich and are continuing to play a larger role in Africa, especially UAE, but also others. Um, Turkey, of course, is starting to play a larger role. Brazil is looking to play a more significant role in Africa. President Lula is going to be traveling to several countries in Africa in conjunction with his trip to the BRICS summit uh, later this year in South Africa. Uh, you actually saw, you know, just to speak to the uh, Latin American angle, uh, the vice president of Colombia, Francia Marquez, who of course is Afro descended herself, do a big trip all throughout the African continent and Colombia reopen some embassies and say they want to engage. Uh, Venezuela is another country that has a very significant number of diplomatic engagements and expanding economic cooperation. Cuba, obviously, many long, uh, you know, histories there as well. You know, Japan, which is part of the West, plays a big role there. Um, but, you you know, you can see that ultimately the changes in terms of not just having one power center, but having multiple large economic entities that are looking and willing to work with African continents is creating uh, work with the African continent is creating at least a possibility for different changes. And I think it speaks to the point you're making. I think, you know, the people of Africa have wanted significant changes in their living standards for quite some time. Um, but I think what you're seeing coincide with the sort of social explosions that are leading to these military transitions in West Africa uh, is a certain sense of possibility. And I think in terms of elements of the elite, this is why you're seeing elements of the military, elements of the former political elites, elements of the former economic elites, I think be more bold in uniting with the masses of people of their own country to make a change, because it seems like not only you know would they be overturning the government, but there are more opportunities to change the economic subset. And I think, again, that exists on multiple different levels. It certainly exists on the level of people who are in the military or other parts of the establishment that do want to see things change and are honestly aligning with the masses of people and hoping to lift up the working class and the peasantry in a real way. But I think even for the people who are basically opportunist, um, who are only doing this for their own power, you know, many of them are doing it because they see multipolarity offering them an opportunity to jump up in the value chain and to not simply just be at the lowest possible rung, but to increase their own, um, you know, situation, which gives them a certain confluence of interest, because moving up in the value chain probably does mean at least a slightly stepped up better standard of living for the average uh, group of people. But again, and as I said earlier, how that plays out, I think is very, very important to whether or not these are real substantive changes, or really just sort of like semi cosmetic changes, there'll be more than 
cosmetic, but not that much more, you know, maybe not just skin deep, but only a little deeper. That's yet to be seen. But nonetheless, I think multipolarity is what's creating that confluence. But then there's a deeper question. And this is the question that's been raised by, by many. Um, and what I've argued you know, quite a number of times. Multipolarity in and of itself is not necessarily good. I mean, there was multipolarity right before World War I, and we see where it led us, right? And you could just have a multipolarity that's just an existence of a bunch of regimes, some good, some bad, but a lot of them are you know, just as bad as before in a way. There's just a different lineup of who it was, um, as opposed to multipolarity leading to a whole new global reality where the average person that is living below the poverty line, living in hunger, uh, suffering from lack of infrastructure, suffering from the impacts of climate change, not able to have jobs or employment because of the crisis of unemployment, uh, the crisis of living standards, the lack of health care, of education, all these different things, a multipolarity that can change people's lives, uh, that's you know where you know things have to transition in a real way. And I think that's one of the questions that's on the table here in terms of Africa. And you know, when you look at what's happening, you look at, you know, the Niger, Guinea, Mali, maybe, uh, you know, Burkina Faso combine, if you will, as to the extent it grows and the extent it starts to come together. Uh, you look at, you know, what has ultimately is attempting to be sabotaged in East Africa by the West through this hybrid war concept in the Horn of Africa, the idea of a new Horn of Africa, um, which, you know, in many ways is anchored by Eritrea, which is a small country, but has a lot of resonance in Sudan and in Somalia and Ethiopia and the possibilities that exist there. In the SADC countries that have their own problems, but because of their history and national liberation movements have sort of their own kind of way of working together. Um, you see that at least the possibility of deeper regional integration inside of African countries that at least has the possibility of becoming poles in and of themselves, because they are, are you know, the countries are not only so rich, but have such great uh, human resources, the ability to sort of, uh, you know, develop their own role to a much higher degree, I think is very much there. I mean, Ethiopia already, you look at Ethiopian airlines is like the main air bridge for air freight between large parts of industrial China and Brazil. So that already puts a country like Ethiopia in a global pivot point vis-a-vis -vis the growing multipolarity world economy and the relationships of the BRICS nations. Unsurprisingly, Ethiopia has, has applied to join the BRICS. And obviously, Ethiopia, just south of Eritrea, of course, um, and if those countries are able to work more closely together, you know, the ability of uh, you know, that to become a, a deeper node of trade and things going in and out of the Red Sea region and the relationship between Egypt, Sudan, you know, even Saudi Arabia to some degree, Eritrea, Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan is, is hard to kind of explain all in a very quick way. Um, but when you start to really look at the way that things are playing out in terms of the industrial growth, the economic growth, the different plans, the infrastructure, you can start to see how in East Africa, maybe in the Sahel, maybe in Southern Africa, there are different potential nodes that are developing there that have different political characters in and of themselves. But I think what's happening right now in the Sahel and the new Horn of Africa project that's happening in the East, um, you know, are offering a lot of different possibilities and also many, many different contradictions. And I think are maybe the two hopeful poles and a lot of actually, you know, East Africa in the sense we know it is actually part of the Sahel, Sudan, Eritrea, um, part of the Sahel region um, are offering on sort of both sides of the continent, you know, potentialities of, of, of their own economic elements, if they can deepen the integration. There's other places where it could happen, but where I think the contradictions are too great um, right now for it to really be on the agenda in a big way, the Great Lakes region of, of Central Africa and so on and so forth. But I just say that to say that I think that's also part of what's happening here. And I think this is what Putin spoke to at the Russia-Africa Summit of Africa becoming a big part of the multipolar world in and of itself, is as these countries change their politics and hopefully can change their economic and social setup, they then also start to become more powerful players in their own right on the global stage. They already are to some degree, which is why you see more entities, whether they are actually trying to do it or not, right, uh, speaking to the demands of Africans to improve their situation over and above where it's been, which is total subordination, total poverty, and total manipulation and marginalization, despite the fact they control a huge amount of the wealth uh, of the world and have some of the greatest material resources that exist. Yeah, I love the idea that the way you put it about Africa should be a pole in and of itself. I mean, even not just Africa. I mean, Africa is a, a continent over over a billion people with all of these resources. But even just like different regions of Africa, given the immense amount of resources it has for the world. I mean, that's why you had a Berlin conference in the late 1880s or in the 1880s to 
you know, for the Europeans to essentially chop Africa up. Yeah, and which, uh, by and the so way, I have to say, that was done as a quote unquote humanitarian intervention. You know, they said, oh, it, was, really? they said it was about ending slavery in the African continent. That's what the Berlin Conference was was about. That's a whole deeper conversation. I mean, there were there are there was slavery on the African continent, but either way, it just shows that when they say we're going for democracy, we're going for human rights. Well, they said that then too. And look how that turned out in terms yeah. of the issue of colonialism. So they're saying they're going in now for democracy and human rights, but it's really just to maintain the neo-colonial status quo, which is basically to keep Africans as poor as possible and as you know far away from any access to any sort of economic development, because that is the basis for the wealth of the global north. It's not by accident that this is happening. It's that the basis of them to be able to do what they want to do requires an extremely poor African continent that can be easily exploited for both its material and human resources. And I don't think we can lose sight of that. It's not just that they're mean and evil and racist, even though they are mean and evil and racist, but it's also because their own survival, the West, especially Europe, especially Europe, more than the United States, which is, is much lesser in terms of trade with Africa, but especially Europe. This is why you had so many French leaders say that there is no future for France without Africa. It's actually true. Without the exploitation of the African continent, there is no European you know, advanced economies. That's not real. It doesn't exist. And so the keeping Africa subordinated is a key factor in the entire geostrategic reality of the West because their own prosperity is based on it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the U.S. has a lot of its own resources. I mean, the U.S. is actually just of Europe, <laughs> settler, the European settler colonialism that then you know broke off on its own. But yeah, Europe can't survive. That's why Europe had to do settler colonialism. That's why Europe had to do imperialism, is because, like you said, it doesn't have the resources to live in luxury and survive the way it has without just completely looting the global south, particularly Africa, given its. Uh, geographical proximity. Um, real quick, I just want to remind people once again, um, this is the part where I berate our audience because I only I see 900, over 900 people have liked this episode, Eugene, but Good. twice that many people are actually watching okay. it. So if you do like the episode, but haven't actually liked it, please hit the like button because the more likes it has, the more people who will see it afterwards. And I think this topic is incredibly important. The more people who see it, the better. Uh, and one thing, you know, I want to end on Eugene, because this has been such an informative uh, episode uh, on, on what's happening in Niger and, of course, all around the region. Um, we do hear threats of an invasion. There was a deadline on August 6th uh, of a military intervention. Sorry, there was a deadline on August 6th. If this former president is not returned to power, if the situation isn't reversed, then these neighboring countries are going to invade and do it militarily with the backing of the U.S. and France. That did not happen um, after August 6th. So do you, I mean, I know we can't sit here and predict anything for sure because anything can happen at any time, but what do you think, why do you think the the there wasn't an invasion? Why do you think that this bluff was called? Uh, what do you think prevented uh, these neighboring countries and their Western backers from going through with some sort of military intervention? I think it's probably a few different factors, but I think it could all pretty much be grouped under the uh, umbrella of a lot of opposition to it. I mean, of course, you saw Mali and Burkina Faso and Guinea, you know, immediately come out and say they opposed and they viewed, you know, Mali and uh, Burkina Faso said they viewed it as a, it would be viewed as an attack against them. So the possibility of the war expanding beyond Niger into a regional conflict was very significant. And as I pointed out, you know, that's, you know, people have to understand that the, the way this could play out could be very complex. I mean, you know, you've got Niger, you know, 53% of the population is Hausa. A lot of the parts of, of Nigeria, the Hausa play a big role in the Nigerian military as well as the military in Niger. Um, so that's, a you know, a factor that who knows how that could play out in terms of the different relationships ethnically, regionally, um, if there is really a conflict and then how does that, you know, exacerbate and potentially make the conflict worse. Then you have the opportunity, the reality that the fact that you might have like an ISIS type scenario in, in Iraq slash Syria, where if the countries are fighting each other, then, you know, some sort of, you know, ISIS, Al Qaeda type caliphate, quote unquote, um, hate the way they manipulate the history of Islamic peoples, but nevertheless could arise, which could create its own challenges that exist there. Um, so I think just that fact in and of itself, um, you know, has given a lot of people pause that it could become a big regional issue in a bigger way than people think. I mean, you look at Senegal, for instance, that had said they would participate. Senegal, which, by the way, has just banned the largest opposition party, PASTEF. They banned Umar Sanko, who probably would have won the elections next year. Let's see if that gets turned around. So, if they, and, you know, the vast majority of people in Senegal 
do not want, I, or I don't know, I can't say that. A lot of them I doubt want a war. And certainly, you know, when you look at the large opposition forces, they've been similarly critical of France, similarly critical of things like the CFA, Frank. So if Senegal goes to war in Niger, I mean, what opens up on the home front then? Is that destabilize things from that perspective? Um, similar things can be said of Cote d'Ivoire, where there's a lot of resistance to the government, especially in the working class districts of the capital. Um, you know, does that then create a space where people start to rise up more significantly? So in addition to the war expanding, in addition to creating in the region, northern Nigeria, so on and so forth, a broader conflict there, even in the areas that are further away from the conflict zone, it could start to increase the level of instability inside of these countries. And that's why you can see, I think, the Nigerian Senate, for instance, saying that they're just not interested and that they do not want to have a military solution. They want a political solution. That's why you did see people march in Senegal against that um, against the idea of intervention. It's why I think you see in a country like Chad, and I have to say this is one of the most interesting developments because Chad is also seen as a major node for the West in France. And they've been quiet about it, but they were not against, they were not for an intervention. I think a lot of people felt for it to succeed. Chad had to be involved. I think they're very concerned about the fallout. And then the other big heavyweight player that came in was Algeria. Algeria, you know, is, plays a very important role in Africa and the Arab world. Um, it exists in a geopolitical space where it's sort of a pivot point between African interest and Arab interest. And it's played that role for a very long time, since 1962. It has probably the most powerful military in Africa. Um, it has, a, I think, a thousand kilometer border with Niger. So they have a lot. Uh, and I think that Algeria, which has been heavily hit as well, by a similar type of insurgent politics, they had a civil war, of course, is very, very sensitive to the idea uh, of, of supercharging the war in the Sahel and very concerned. And they just straight up said that there will be no solution without Algeria. And I do think that made a big difference. I find it hard to believe that ECOWAS would go forward in any way, shape or form if they thought Algeria was against them, um, especially if they thought it might bring Algeria in on the side of Niger, which would probably make it a lot easier for Niger to win. You know, most of these African, West African nations do not really have that legitimate of militaries. Most of them are oriented mainly towards fighting insurgencies. So maybe against a country like Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, who knows how it will play out. But if Algeria became involved, you know, what Libya would do, unclear. Obviously, the country's divided, but, you know, that's also another factor that's here. So I think ultimately what it comes down to is at the ground level, there's a huge amount of opposition. Uh, obviously, in Niger itself, um, there's a lot of people on the ground who do not want to see this happen whatsoever. So, you know, what kind of resistance would they offer, you know, in terms of, in, you know, a, even a, a guerrilla conflict, even if they were able to take the capital? There's the possibility of supercharging the insurgencies in the desert areas. There's the possibility of deeper instability on the home front and basically every other ECOWAS nation, almost all of whom are containing a lot of very angry people who want to see changes in their country. So I think that ultimately it was one of those things where they were talking big, but then when it actually got down to like mm -hmm. what it would take and what could potentially come of it, you start to see, I think, them getting a little cold feet. Now we'll see. They're going to meet on Thursday. Perhaps they will decide to go forward. I mean, even when they said they were ready to go forward, they said it was the very last resort. So I thought even then you could see you know, they're backing away. Nigeria overall seems to be backing away a little bit. And I think it's just really the accumulated contradictions of what's going on um, are, are not making it possible that from a bottom up and a top down perspective, from a geopolitical and a domestic perspective, it was not necessarily looking like the right move. But I don't want to say that it's over or that it won't happen. Because like I said, you know, a lot of these Egoas governments who are against what's happening in Niger, they, I mean, they're saying they're worried about a domino effect. They themselves are very concerned that their own populations feel so aggrieved that they too would rise up in a way that perhaps elements of the military and the elite would ally with them in order to overthrow the existing political power. So they, I think, are very fearful of what's happening here, very fearful of what it could lead to, very fearful for the destabilization of elite politics in West Africa, and you know, which is a key link and node for imperialism in the African continent. Um, and I think you know, might be willing to do something, even that seems foolish, um, to try to prevent that from happening. And I think that to some degree, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that has not gone away. And we'll see what happens on Thursday. I think from the point of view of the Western powers, it's also a mixed bag. Um, I mean, you can see from a lot of U.S. commentators, former diplomats in the region, are sort of suggesting maybe it's not worth it to intervene because of all the issues that I just laid out that it could actually make everything significantly worse. You know, in the EU, it's, you see mixed things from different people, but the biggest thing for the EU is this would probably massively increase 
people trying to come to Europe as immigrants. And of course, we know that that is heavily shaping the politics all across the EU right now. And it's hard for me to really believe you're going to be able to gen up a huge amount of support for a big intervention. Like maybe if it seemed small and it was going to be a surgical strike and everyone was against Niger and like you could do it quickly and get out, the EU is all for it. But you can see them kind of backing away softly, softly as the implications of it become true, because I think they can see how it could really backfire uh, on them. And you could have <laughs> some political regimes in Europe thrown out too on yeah. the back of these extremely racist anti-immigrant movements that are using this completely absurd great replacement theory nonsense um, in order to push their political agenda inside of the countries. Yeah, I, we know that the, the EU is definitely opposed to anything that creates more migration. Um, then it doesn't make any sense why they support Western or U.S. policy everywhere else. But uh, on that note, this was an incredibly important episode. Thank you to everybody who watched. And once again, if you haven't already, please make sure you click the like button. It'll help us in the algorithm. And also just a quick reminder, you can become a Breakthrough News member and access exclusive content uh, from Breakthrough News at patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. Eugene, can you remind everybody where they can also follow you? Of course. Well, you can follow me directly on Twitter at Eugene Per Year. I think so you mean X. I think you mean X. Whatever. Yeah, well, <laughs> Whatever it's called. <laughs> um, although now you don't tweet, you post. Uh, real <laughs> galaxy brain there. It but, goes something like that, right? At <laughs> Eugene Per Year. No, unless you can find me there. And of course, you can find us at BT Newsroom across all your social media platforms for Breakthrough News. And you can usually find Rania and I at 3 p.m. Eastern time yes. here uh, on YouTube for Breakthrough News with the Freedom Side on Thursdays. So those are a few of the places you can check us out. And once again, thank you to everybody who watched and uh, commented. And make sure you like the episode. And Eugene, once again, thank you so much for joining me on Dispatches. Thanks so much for having me.